Anin, can you hear me okay? Hello, Anin Nindawe Maganaduk. Nigagoy get to Magas, Spine Sikwe, and to go Makwa and Odeam, Gababani Kagish, Kanagating, and Nunjibamigwich. I'm greeting you in Anishinaabe Moa, and that's the language of our territory, and uh, thanking you very much for the honor of being here with you today. I was um, really privileged to be asked. I'm grateful to the healthcare industry and to all of you who have taken care of so many of us. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to the organization and my good friend Paul Bogart, who I've known for many years, for inviting me. So as I reflected on what to uh, talk to you about today, I, I have to admit that the PowerPoint has just been evolving during the day, so if I look a little confused at the slides, bear with me. But this is a piece of art from our territory. This is, um, the artist is called Roy Thomas, and he's passed away, but um, this is called We're All in the Same Boat. I guess you can see how that would work out at that art, right? Um, but this is Anishinaabe art, and I always like to show our art from our region. I'll show you a little bit later where I'm from, but you know, I know that I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, and if you wanted to study the art from Europe or the art um, from America, you went to the Fine Arts Department in the Fogg Museum. But if you wanted to study the art from Native America, you went to the Anthropology Museum, the Peabody. And so what I want to suggest is that it is possible that um, indigenous knowledge systems have value. We have not been valued, by and large, in most academic institutions. But we have a lot of knowledge in our own systems. And I want to talk a little bit about those. And I also think, frankly, that it is perhaps possible that the solution to some of the challenges we are faced in the present world may not be found in the same paradigm which created them. And so that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's a phrase in our language which is minobamadaziwan. Minobamadaziwan, which means the good life. And that has to do with the spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional well-being. That is something that we as Anishinaabe people strive to, uh, to, to have. And you do that not through uh, just a prayer, or not through going to your, just a lodge or your ceremonies, but you do that through how you live your life. And it is a covenant that we have with the Creator how we are, you know, we are intended to be here as Anishinaabe being and to live this good life. And in order to do that, we have an agreement of how we relate to the rest of the world. In Dinawe Muganaduk, all our relatives, whether they have fin fins or win wings or roots or paws, that is who we think of when we are in this world. We have an intergenerational set of responsibilities. They call it, I think in economic terms, intergenerational equity and that we are responsible to the ones that have passed before and we are responsible to the ones who are not yet here. We have an understanding that most of the world around us is alive, has spirit, has being, has standing unto itself. And once you treat that world in a good way, and we will do better if we do, su if, if we do such. So that is what I strive to do really in my life and the people from this territory, that is very much what we strive for. You know, it is interesting that the word hospital in our language is Ayakos Wigamig, Ayakos Wigamig, which means the house that you go to when you're sick. <laughs> um, it doesn't say Minoya Wigamig, which mean the well-being house, right? And so I think that all of us are here because we would like to be the people that provide for well-being. We would like to ensure the long-term health of all of us who are here. And I reflect on that as kind of the paradigm that we are faced with. This is where I live. I live in the middle of the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. Um, you all know where Minnesota is. How many of you know where the White Earth Reservation is? Any of you? How about Bemidji and Fargo? How are we doing there? Good? Very good. I live between Bemidji and Fargo. That's where my reservation is. And um, this is the lake upon which I live. This is basically what it looks like. I live in a place in the world where it's pretty good. You can still drink the water from a spring and the water from a lake. You can still eat the sugar from a tree. You can eat the fish from a lake. It has a very, very healthy ecosystem. And a lot of our work and our responsibility is to keep it that way. You know, it's interesting because I was in Los Angeles yesterday in uh, East LA. And I was visiting with a lady a little bit earlier who lives there. And I, I had no idea how polluted it got in some of the me mega cities because I had not been there for so long. And I came back with like a really bad headache. And I was really, my sinuses were bothering me. And I was thinking, it's so tragic how many people have to live like that, you know, and how grateful I was just to get back to my little city, Minneapolis, you know, which is a big city, but not really in the spectrum of things. And I was so grateful to be able to breathe the air and to know that the water was good here. So these seasons that we have now, we just finished Ishkigami Zigigizis. 
In the moon of um, Anishinaabeg people in the moons, they are named after those things which the Creator gave us. So Namei Benegizus is in the spring. It starts around February, which is the, the sucker moon, when the suckers, which is a kind of fish, move under the ice. Then we have a moon in, in March, which is called Onabanagizus, Onabanagizus, which means the hard-crusted snow moon. Also the moon that you don't want to do a face plant in the snow. <laughs> then we have a, snow, a moon that is uh, Iskigami Zigigizus, which is the maple sugaring moon. And that's what you're seeing in this Anishinaabe beadwork. You can see our maple leaves here. Then we have a moon, Wabaganagizus, which is where we are now, and that is the flower moon. Odaymanagizus, the strawberry moon. Meangizus, that'd be the blueberry moon that comes around July in our territory. Then we have a moon that is known as Manomanakegizus, the wild rice making moon. Watibagagizus, leaves falling moon. Gashkadno Gizes, freezing over moon. Those are some of the moons that we have in our language. I thought you might like to hear a little bit about that. But that is really a way of life and a worldview. And I say that because, um, I don't know, did you notice that none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor? <laughs> I just want to let you know it's okay. You can have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with the Roman emperor and you'll be okay. So let me talk a little bit about us and the good life that the Creator gave us. This is some Anishinaabe beadwork, and you can see those maple leaves in there. So I was reading along here, and you know, I always kind of laugh. I don't chuckle, but I was like when the medical journals come out with some fantastic new discovery, and I say, oh yeah, we knew that. Pretty much the case on a lot of things, you know, as, as you look out there. And um, so um, recently, maple syrup, it turns out, uh, boosts your antibiotics. Did you all read that article? You should have your maple syrup. But it said the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that about 2 million people are infected with these superbugs every year, 23,000 die. They talk about these, these resistant forms. Anyway, this study done that just came out and was presented at the American Chemical Society's 253rd meeting suggests that maple syrup extract can drastically improve the an action of antibiotics without enhancing any of their other side effects. Over 90% less antibiotics are needed to achieve the same effect. I think about that because each spring, our people, including my youngest son this year, went out for his fast. We fast in the spring. We fast like all throughout the year, but he fasted, and we always drink maple sap when we fast. And we're told that that is like what the Creator gave us. The word ininitog, which is the word for maple, means it refers to that that's the roots of your ancestors coming back up and feeding you in the spring. That's what it talks about because you know that the, it comes up through the roots, right? You know, and that is what your, how your ancestors nourish you. And so my community is blessed with these great, uh, you know, this great health, traditionally. You know, some of our people live to be pretty darn old in the old days, 104, 105 years old, because we had a good life. We eat these things, and we take care, and we, we use our maple sap. This here is fiddlehead ferns. I picked these this week. This is the ecosystem of the North, you know? Fiddlehead ferns are high in vitamin A, fat-soluble vitamin, essential for healthy vision and immune system. A 100-gram serving of raw fiddlehead ferns provides 3,617 3, IUs of the vitamin A. It's, uh, they're pretty cool, too. Anybody had them before? Yeah. So I just picked a bunch up North. You know, that is the ecosystem within which I live. That's the ecosystem that I'm trying to preserve. And this here is chaga. Any of you guys heard of chaga before? <laughs> Lorna, that's my sister in the front. She's like, yeah. <laughs> so chaga grows on birch trees. And um, you know now it's getting harvested more because it's like a new superfood or something like that. But you, know, you shouldn't because it takes a long time to grow it. And so it's a mushroom that grows on the side of the birch. And it's a real slow growing mushroom. And because it's so slow, it has to like pack everything in. Like I don't understand how that all works, but it like packs it all in. And they have to be super tough because they're hanging out for 10 years in really cold temperatures, right? So they're like the tough mushroom or the tough guys. And um, it's viewed as one of the power most powerful antioxidants on earth. It's a super adaptogen. Does that mean something to you, adaptogen? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like a plant that can have like multiple personalities or something. You know, it can apply for different things according to what the circumstance is. That's some of the magic that is contained within our plants. I don't really know about the prescriptions that you have, but, you know, so they're a powerful antioxidant, and then they have 200 plus phytonutrients, significant amounts of riboflavin and niacin, B vitamins, and they have 
um, things that help your adrenal glands and digestive processes. And then they have a lot of other magic things. It's um, 215, I just got a lot. But you know, I wanna say is, is that in the world that the creator gave us, these all live. And our covenant is really this, is you take care of the garden that the creator gave you and that will be there to provide for the generations that come. You know, and that is really, we are all in this together. You take care of the garden that the creator gave you and they'll be there for generations to come. And so those are some of the medicines of our territory. This is how we take care of ourselves traditionally in my territory. I'm not a Christian person. I'm a member of our Medewin Lodge. This is some pictures of our Medewin Lodges in old, old time. You know, I had an interesting conversation not too long ago I, I with, with a, like a Catholic, um, um, I was trying to think, uh, what's the high guys in that bishop? That's his name, um, a bishop. And he's like, uh, how old is that? I said, I think they say about 7,000 years old. You know, all these things they found, like the stories and everything they found. But that's how we also doctor ourselves. We reaffirm our relationship and we, we have our own traditional medicines that have been very significant historically. These are some super old pictures. Obviously, that one on the left is um, pictograph. It was actually flooded out in Manitou Rapids when they put in the dam project. But we have that same lodge today. And they are starting up here in the next couple of weeks. And our people will send to those lodges. But I want to say that the practice of our traditional medicines, the practice of our traditional religion, has been something that has not gone well with the United States generally. Many of our religions were outlawed. In 1977, the United States passed the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, recognizing our right to practice our religion. But before that, like our Sundance religions, a lot of our doctoring and healing ceremonies had been, had been uh, gone underground, you know, or people were really punished for them. And so I think that, you know, you as medical practitioners, I think that you want people to be healthy. And perhaps you know as well as I do that there are different ways that people can be treated and different medicines. You know, I go when I, my, I, I had a horse sit on me a couple years ago, not a good thing, you know. He reared up and he flipped over on me. I go see you guys when a horse sits on me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to go to the lodge. I'm going to go get somebody to patch me up and hang out, you know. I didn't like the Oxycontin much, you know, that didn't work out too well for me, but, you know, thank, thank, very thankful to Sanford for taking care of me and, uh, you know, I can, I, I'm good. You know, but you, you understand what I'm saying, and I think that you understand that because you are here, is that there are a lot of different ways to practice wellness. And what we want is our people to be well, whoever they are. And in our case, a lot of these are not only, a, you know, it's a spiritual practice and it's a physical and an emotional practice, it's also physical. You know, because you have to go and take care of those things, so you have to go harvest them. You have to go be outside, agua ching. You know, you cannot just take the extract inside. You have to be a present and a part of that, which is something which is a healing into itself. I know you all know about things like that nature deficit disorder, you know, that they talk about. And we're like the opposite. And I think even my friend Paul Bogart remembers, he was at my house once and I locked all my kids outside. I said, do not come inside, it's nice. You know, I mean, you know how kids, they try to sneak back inside and be lazy. I'm like, you're not doing that. It's nice. You're Ojibwe. Stay out, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it is, it is really, you know, what we want is wellness. And that is a challenge for a lot of our Native people, you know, because today there are battles which have been going on for years. But this is Wintu people in Northern California. Some of you are from California. They are just down from the Shasta Dam project, flooded them out a long time ago and they're trying to keep them from raising the water levels to increase the water that you know, would go into the Shasta Dam and be available. And in the case of like a California drought, there are implications of policy decisions that are significant on people. And I'll, you know, I'll talk little about the health conditions of a lot of our people, but when people want to continue you know, something that they've been doing for as long as they have been those people, it's important to try to protect their ability to do that because that is really how they stay well. This is Bear's Ear. This is a national monument, last created ma national monument that was created. It was under the Obama administration. And that is uh, being questioned now, um, as are all national monuments. But this national monument, like I don't really, I, I, I've never been there. But when I was asked, I was told by a Zuni man that he said it was the cathedral to which people go to pray and to reaffirm their relationship and to talk to their ancestors. And that a lot of their ancestors are buried there and so in as much as, you know, many of us might go to a cemetery to put out your flowers on Memorial Day, those people always go and put out their dishes and their thanksgiving to their ancestors in that same place. 
So these are places that reaffirm your health. They reaffirm your health. And that is what I really you know, would like to see. So from, a, from an indigenous perspective, and I don't think it is really just from an indigenous perspective, the caretaking of our world, our natural world, is part of what we are responsible for. Because after all, we humans are the ones that mess things up. You know, the bears aren't messing things up. The moose isn't messing things up, it's us. And so I always feel like we have a spiritual opportunity to do the right thing and to be the greater people that the Creator intended for us to be. This is the people of Oak Flats. These are Apache people that are trying to protect the place where they have their womanhood ceremonies. A lot of you, you know, maybe have seen these discussions about the issues around puberty, maybe increasing, you know, the, the age is, is going lower now, you know, with the introduction of all the chemicals in our environment. A lot of young women are coming into their time earlier, you know. But in, in all of our traditional practices as Anishinaabe people and as other people, the coming of time, you know, the coming of your womanhood has been a very significant time that is marked in ceremony, you know, and, uh, and I think it is important. And, you know, a lot of our young women today, not just in my community, but in a lot of communities, suffer from a lot of self-esteem, health issues, you know, and this is a way that reaffirms them as young women. And so it is really essential to people's health and well-being. And this is, uh, this, you know, community is facing a large mining project, Rio Tinto Zinc, and they have been hanging on for their sacred site, hanging on for their sacred site. So this is the reservations in northern Minnesota. I'm just going to ground you a little bit on, uh, you know, where we are in the north here, and I'm the large one to the far right. Uh, that is the White Earth Reservation, but this is uh, the, the reservations and territories kind of in our region. And this is a very, you know, there are a lot of Native people in the state of Minnesota, but there are a lot of Native people, you know, perhaps you don't see them, but there are many of them are probably in your service areas. And this is our most sacred food, our wild rice. I hope you have a chance to eat some wild rice when you're in Minnesota, or if not, you can, of course, order it online from us, you know, or from other folks, but this is, um, you know, this is what a sustainable economy looks like. Just say that for 10,000 years you harvested rice on the same lake. You know what I'm saying? You got, got that? Like, I think that's a pretty good indicator of a sustainable economy. And what we do is we go out with two sticks in a canoe. We go in and out in that month, which is Mano Minike Gizes, the wild rice making moon. We go out kind of end of August, early September, and uh, we go and harvest our wild rice, two sticks in a canoe, and and uh, my sister Lorna pulls, although, and, and I knock, or, you know, you sit in the back and you knock that rice into the canoe, and then you bring it in, and you, these guys are gathering it up in their gunny sacks. I really like, if you look close, you can see that USAID bag of lentils, and I have no idea how that got in the middle of my reservation. It's one of those, like, conundrums, a mystery that I would like to follow up on. How did the lentils bag from, from Africa get in the middle of the White Earth Reservation? I have no idea. but. Um, you know, we, we, uh, you know we, we bag it up and then we parch it over a fire, we dance on it, or we run it through a thrashing machine and then uh, we serve it. And it has about twice the protein and half the calories of white rice. And it is, uh, you know, very high. It's got uh, astonishing impact on cholesterol, they say. You know, and I had a big fight with the University of Minnesota a few years ago. Excuse me if anybody's here from the university, but the University of Minnesota, and in 2000, they had cracked the DNA sequence of wild rice in some of their research. And, um, you know, they're super proud of themselves, and we are very concerned because it, they, they began then to discuss genetic engineering. And we just feel that the words wild rice should not be associated with the words genetic engineering. We feel like wild should mean something, you know, and it's not genetically engineered. And so the U was all proud, and the, and the Ojibwe were not pleased, you know, and so we had a long, a long, long set of discussions with the University of Minnesota over that. Because I think that while there is something called academic freedom, which is what they discussed, there should also be academic responsibility. You cannot do something like release a genetically engineered organism that could change the rice of an ecosystem of the people to whom rely on it for thousands of years. But we're very strong in our, in our wild ricing. And you know, I just want you to look a little bit at these men. This is who I work for. This is a community I work for. A lot of these guys, you know, might be a little chubby, but what I want to say is, look, these are like your, your um, what you call them, like risk population, super high risk population. 
A lot of these guys, like the average age of a ricer on my reservation is about 25, 26 year old man. Those are the guys that are most likely to be arrested. Those are the guys that are most likely to have some kind of a violent situation. Those are the guys that are highest levels of addiction. You know, everything really scary, that's what they got. But these are the same guys, you see them in this moment. See them in this moment living that Minobamata Zewan, that good life, and they're happy beings. They're happy because they get to be who the Creator intended for them to be. So really, that is what my work is about, or our work at Honor the Earth and White Earth, is really to ensure that our people are able to continue that which the Creator gave us, because our health and well-being is really predicated on having a good ecosystem, being able to harvest our rice for each year in perpetuity. So here's a little bit of the down part of this speech where I'm going to tell you about our problems. My problems don't have to do with oil in my reservation. My problems have to do with oil which comes from elsewhere. So my reservation and the reservations in northern Minnesota are faced with a series of pipelines. We have six pipelines that are owned by the Enbridge Corporation. They were put in in 1960, 1959, the first set of them. And a lot of you who live in the cities, you know this problem, uh, the aging infrastructure problem. That's what we got. This one pipeline known as Line 3, which is the one that ends up as Line 5 and ends up at the Kalamazoo spill uh, area, is a pipeline that is in a state of deterioration. They were put in before the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. They ran across our territories. And I'm like all you, I didn't really pay attention to pipelines, you know? And actually, I'm not opposed to pipelines. I really like water and sewer. I think they're fabulous, you know? I really think that, you know, gas, you know, in a city you should have gas, you know what I'm saying? But I, I want them to work, not explode, right? And in the case of the Northern Minnesota Territory, there's a lot of questions about the history and the future of these lines. So what happened is, is that in the year 2013, the Enbridge Corporation, a Canadian corporation, announced that it wanted to bring a pipeline. It was called the Sandpiper, Pipeline 1 called the Sandpiper, across our territory. That pipeline was a 640,000 barrel per day fracked oil pipeline coming out of North Dakota. They told the state of Minnesota and the Ojibwe that this was a critical an essential route, the only possible route would go through our reservation. It's that lower shot, you know. The northern ones or the lines that already exist are in the north. There's six up there and there's a new one they want to put there. So we opposed them. We stood and we went to every regulatory hearing. Our people prayed. We had ceremonies. Uh, Non-Indian people, friends of the headwaters, filed a legal case, finally forcing an environmental impact statement on the proposed Sandpiper pipeline because this is a pipeline that would cross our best wild rice beds. This is a pipeline which would act as, it would disrupt the water tables in the region. But besides that, if any of you have been to northern Minnesota, it's a lot of lakes. And if you get oil in any of them, it's gonna go into everything. Every aquifer and lake is related in the north. And so to us, the devastation of an oil spill would be immense. And so we are very, very concerned about these lines. So for, you know, and, and our organization itself and my sister, we prayed hard and we rode our horses. We rode our horses all along the proposed pipeline route against the current of the oil. We rode for four years. And one day after uh, we finished our fourth ride, uh, one day after that and, and uh, in the midst of the court ordered EIS process in the state of Minnesota, the Enbridge company announced that it was gonna cancel that pipeline they were not gonna go ahead with the sandpiper. Uh, it was a very big relief to our community. You know, a lot of you have probably been at hearings. You know, it breaks my heart to hear my people cry in front of a, a, a hearing officer. Cry about how scared they are about what's gonna happen. Cry about how much duress they're already under. And cry about like what might happen if they can't you know, get their rice there. That's what our people did, you know. I was really, really upset about it. And we worked really hard. And so they did cancel that pipeline, 640,000 uh, barrel per day pipeline. But the problem was is that the Enbridge Company, uh, um, one, is coming back with a new pipeline. The first hearings were today called Line 3. Line 3 is a 915,000 barrel per day pipeline of tar sands oil, exactly the same corridor. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that does to a community, like just the duress of thinking about something like that. Because a lot of you are health providers, but it is not a good thing for our community, what we are facing. But the bigger picture looks, you know, something like this. So when they first talked about that pipeline, they talked about how, you know, we should all figure out how to accommodate fracking and fracked oil. 
And I'm having a little trouble with that to start with, okay? So 2005, the Halliburton Amendment is passed, part of the National Energy Policy Act. That allowed for fracking basically to explode in this country because fracking companies are not required to disclose the 602 chemicals that they are using in fracking, and that they are punching down with a set of drills, like this drill here, um, the drills, and then they were not required to disclose. You know, so they, they drill down and then they bust up the bedrock of Mother Earth. They put those 602 chemicals down and hope that what comes, goes down will not come up. I think that's a little bit dangerous as a suggestion. But in addition to that, they also try to market things. So Baker, um, Baker Hughes, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, made these pink oil drill bits. And uh, we really thought that was a problem. You know, I really feel like pink AR-15s <laughs> and drill bits are not really a way to commemorate Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so um, a thousand drill bits were put out there and they gave their money to um, the Susan Komen Foundation for Breast Cancer. And a lot of us were very, very concerned about that because, uh, you know, and this is, I know, a complicated issue in the healthcare business is who gets you, gives you your money. Because I know you're trying to get stuff done, you know, and so you're grateful to get help. But, uh, you know, our feeling is really, um, we did a poster, that's Jane Klebe and myself. Jane Klebe is a, one of the women and leaders in the, in the No KXL, which said uh, fossil fuels are bad for your boobs. We issued that uh, poster and then some people said I couldn't use the word boobs. So I was like, come on, <laughs> you know, I mean, what are you gonna say here? I mean, you know, at the point that we be believe that fossil fuels are good for our breasts, we might need to kind of reevaluate that situation. And I'm just gonna not go into the health data on benzene, you know, and the carcinogens that are in fracking. I'm just gonna say, let us try to avoid getting them in our bodies. And the whole idea that you could kind of market yourself as a fracking company with this suggestion that we're gonna do our bit for the cure with your pink drill bits, I found to be really problematic. And then this is what fracking looks like socially. You know, the rise in North Dakota of sex trafficking and violent crimes against women was dramatic. This is a billboard that, you know, was taken out because there's so many women that went missing out there and so many women in, you know, involved in the sex trafficking. But you know, so what I'm trying to understand is I know a lot of you are not from this area, but I'm just gonna be super open with you. Like I'm fighting pipelines and I was at a county commissioner in Beltrami County up north and he said to me, he said, Winona, I really would prefer a pipeline to a train. We call them the bomb trains. Do you know what I'm talking about? The black trains that are full of oil. they like the one that blew up at Lac Megantique in Quebec where 47 people were vaporized. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The black trains are like, you know, it's so much safer. I said, well, it's not safer, one. In a train system, it's like a multi-purpose. You know what I'm saying? A railroad is multi-purpose. A pipeline is not multi-purpose, right? It's billions of dollars investment into something. But he's like, you know, I'd really rather have that. You know, what I said to him is something, and I hope you don't all take offense, but I said, look, you know, you're telling me that you'd rather have your oil delivered by pipeline than by train. I'm saying, so how would you like your heroin delivered? Would you like it delivered by pipeline or by train? You know, at some level, we have to look at the level of addiction we have to fossil fuels and the broad implications of it on our environment. We have to look at what is happening in our frontline communities. We have to look at the climate change related issues of fossil fuels, and we just gotta kind of like move on. It'd be really time to move on. So, you know, that's what I feel like, is like we need to kind of be honest about the implications of some of the bigger policy issues that we are looking at. So this is what happened when we went to North Dakota. So the Enbridge company cancel our pipeline, 640,000 barrels a day, buys a pipeline known as the Dakota Access Pipeline, buys 28% of it. So we followed them out there. Now this I'm bringing to you as healthcare professionals because this is a little bit of a public health problem. So let us say that there are 10,000 people that go out there basically to protect their water. To give a little background, it is a 570,000 barrel per day fracked oil pipeline, the same oil with all them chemicals in it. Initial proposals for the pipeline were to go north of the city of Bismarck, just north of the city of Bismarck. Well, the city of Bismarck didn't like the idea of a pipeline just north of their city, and so they rerouted it. So it'd be just north of the Standing Rock Reservation. 
Now, the Standing Rock Area Reservation has every health statistic you don't want to have. You know, not only is everybody in poverty, their, their hospital was built in the 1960s, right? They are not served well. Every health indicator, you know, you do not want to have, whether it is diabetes, violence, cancer, you know, you don't need me to give you the litany. But it, they do not have good health there. And so this adds additional trauma to their situation and puts them more at risk. And they also do not have, and still to this date, Dakota Access Energy Transfer Partners has not provided a cleanup plan that would provide for the huge amount of oil that could spill in the case of a spill. So the bigger questions that I'm going to talk a little bit about is what it looks like when civil society goes awry in North Dakota. And that's what I'm going to say. Is it's like, say you are people that would like to keep your water clean. And then what happened in North Dakota, you know, we refer to North Dakota, and I apologize again to anybody from North Dakota because I'm sure you are far more enlightened than some. But North Dakota, we refer to it as the deep north. We refer to it as the deep north as native people for a number of reasons, whether it is the elevated arrest rates, the long incarcerations, the health conditions, or just the racism which continues in North Dakota. And there was a lot of reasons why you know, this happened to us. But you know, this is what it looks like on the ground when they militarize the situation. And what I mean by militarizing the situation is, is that the, the, um, the Morton County called out 1,287 1, policemen from forces across the country. And they came, uh, well, this is a private security firm that put dogs on our people on September 3rd. And that really is kind of a picture that should be like from the 60s. You're not supposed to put dogs on people. It's this question of First Amendment rights and the rights of corporations. That's what happened. And that, this is the incident that some of you may remember Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! was arrested for because this is her footage. This is a still from her footage because she was out there when that happened. This is uh, some of the equipment that was out there. This is, um, was former military equipment, which was surplus to Stutzman County uh, under Homeland Security, from what I understand. And just to kind of give a little bit of a context on this, I don't actually, I didn't know what that equipment was. But so say there's 700,000 people in North Dakota. And say that Stutzman County has 5,000 of them. I'm really not clear why Stutzman County needed the piece of equipment, uh, the, 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 the piece of equipment in the foreground, which is called an MRAP. That's called a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there are no landmines in North Dakota. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, this is an excessive piece of equipment for a rural state. I think it's generally, in my general observation, an excessive piece of equipment for a civilian population. Like, I signed up. I live in the United States. First Amendment, constitutional rights. I feel like I should not get shot at for expressing those as I try to protect my water. MRAP, that's what that's called. And Stutzman County probably only has about 5,000 people in it. The second piece of equipment is called an LRAD, long-range acoustic device. Also, that, like, blow out your eardrums. So health professionals, this is kind of what happened to us. So just think that 10,000 people were subjected to this um, by the state of North Dakota and by uh, the Dakota Access or Energy Transfer Partners. This is, um, you know, when our people are facing that equipment. You know, what I'm going to say about our water protectors, I'm really incredibly grateful to the thousands of water protectors that we had. And I'm really great grateful to all the tens of thousands of people who supported us by sending us, you know, food and clothes and, you know. Um, but, you know, our people are very courageous. And our, our water protectors are our heroes. And how I know this to be true is that I have a set of grandchildren. And I you know, was sitting there at my little kitchen table writing away, trying to write a little article. And I look up, and my grandson, one of my grandsons like, hey, Granny, look at us. And I look, and there's like three 10-year-old boys. Three 10-year-old boys. They all call me Granny. And these three 10-year-old boys, and one is wearing my um, uh, snowmobile helmet, which is known as my um, water protector helmet because you don't want to get hit by a rubber bullet, which is what they used on our people. They used rubber bullets, beanbag um, shots at us, tear gas, a whole bunch of other unknown things. And a lot of our people were injured. Hundreds of our people were injured. So I have this water protector helmet. And so one's wearing my water protector helmet. The second is wearing a gas mask, 
right? Which apparently is like standard issue in my house or something. I have like no idea this gas mask. And the third kid is wearing a bandana. And they all have like little shields and they're like, look, Granny, we're the water protectors. So that is how I know that our people were not only emboldened in North Dakota, but we found, you know, we found, I think that there is something about that moment where we could stand there and remember who we were and remember who, what our courage looked like. And I think a lot of people saw us. And all of those young people remember that. You know, but also there are some huge, huge implications for this, you know, as far as, as what happened to our people. This is a night when they sprayed us, they sprayed on us with, um, you know, it, it was like water mixed with um, uh, fire retardants. They were sprayed all over civilians on the bridge. We don't even know the health implications of a lot of this stuff, you know, all the shot, stuff we were shot with. But you know, what I do know is, is that the implications more broadly are significant for a lot of our community. You know, this is when they're, they're going after us. And you know, so there's a little bit of a story here. This is uh, one of the spiritual leaders. He said, I was singing a prayer song when they started hitting us with the batons. Said Dan Namakin, a youth advocate from Spielem, Washington, who's wearing a headdress and traditional regalia when he was attacked. The sound of wooden batons striking our people was sickening. I had my eagle staff in one hand and a rattle in the other as they forcibly removed us. They pulled me behind a police line and zip, my, zip tied my wrists and then took us to a processing area and put us in vans with no ventilation. We could see the horrific things they were doing to our people, but we couldn't do anything about it. So just to be clear, 840 people were arrested in North Dakota. Every one of those people was strip searched and cavity searched, right? Including like 80 year old women. And people like, you know, Rebecca Kimball, a Madison City Councilwoman. Strip search, cavity search. A lot of those people were put in dog kennels, actually, because they didn't have a correct holding tanks. And people would get, and they would be, have their heads covered. I interviewed a lot of these people. They have their heads covered, stuck in a van, and then they would drive for hours, not knowing where they were going because Morton County didn't have a facility for them. What I'm trying to say is, is that we have a lot of PTSD coming out of this. And it is likely that we will be facing more. And I'm going to, you know, just to be honest about it, like our history of this is not good. If any of you, you know, I understand that there was a speaker earlier who talked a little bit about the health disparities and health equity issues in Minnesota. You know, they are quite marked already in the disparities between Native people and non-Native people in, in North Dakota, in, in, across the country. But those are going to be increasingly significant. And then there is kind of the question of how, I want to say, like, who gets to control the narrative? I don't know if that means anything to any of you, but like, you know, if Fox News didn't see this happen, did it happen, would be one thing I could say, right? And then on the other thing I would say is, it's like, who gets to talk about who did what? And, you know, I'm here in front of you, super grateful with the opportunity, but, you know, there was this discussion about that our camps, when we were forced out, were full of trash. And, and I wrote this story for the Fargo Forum because I write for the Fargo Forum and for Forum Communications, and it was called The Filth of North Dakota. So let me just give you an example of this problem. So Morton County sprayed a lot of stuff on us. We don't know what they sprayed on us, from antifreeze-laden water cannons to mace, and all of that went into the river. Then this guy named David Myers, a rancher, purchased 40,000 pounds of Rosol, a prairie dog poison, on land including the Cannonball Ranch, just adjacent and where the pipeline ended up being, just adjacent to our camps. An uh, EPA-led investigation determined 40,000 pounds of Rosal have been illegally distributed um, on more than 5,400 5, acres of land. It was instead of being applied to prairie dog burrows, the bright blue poison pellets were broadcast on the ground. Dead prairie dogs were left when they died instead of being expe expeditiously removed to protect other wildlife. Six dead eagles were found. Dead bison were found as, e as early as August, and most of that herd continued to die. Six months after he poisoned the land, Meyer sold the Cannonball Ranch to Energy Transfer Partners for a reported $18 million. There's been no cleanup. So what I'm trying to figure out is this, like, the long-term health impacts are pretty significant. And that, those are things that you're going to be dealing with. Like, I have no idea of the health impact of Rosal. I know that it causes you to bleed to death. You know, and that's what happened to some of those, those, you know, animals, things like that. But I just feel like, you know, the era that we are in and that my community is facing is very, very uh, nerve-wracking for all of us. And so just to be clear, you know, we defeated a pipeline proposal in northern Minnesota last year. Got a little breathing room, went out to Standing Rock. 
I did not get arrested and I did not get hit with a bullet, but my sister got hit with a bullet. My board members and some of my family was arrested and some of my family was hit. You know, and so we have, let's just say, a little bit of PTSD from that last experience, right? They are saying that a lot of us will have a significant amount. You know, in my, in my family, in my extended family, we are setting up a healing camp so we can doctor our water protectors, you know, and take care of them. But, you know, just that the sound of the, the military planes or the, or the helicopters over us and the, and the shots at us were really traumatic for a lot of people. But now we are facing today the first opening hearing on the, on the pipelines they're proposing for Minnesota. For those of you in Minnesota, the EIS was released, Environmental Impact Statement. The route, again, goes right through the heart of our territory. And the finding of disproportionate, this is from the EIS, the finding of disproportionate and adverse impacts does not preclude selection of a given alternative. You know, they are saying that the impacts are magnified because they are associated with tribal communities who are non-removable. So we are really uh, nervous about what is happening and, and coming our way. And so to me, kind of the bigger picture of what we are looking at in terms of the health of my community are larger societal issues about where we are going and what we are doing. And they do not, as I said in the beginning, they do not only affect us, they affect everybody because they are larger environmental issues. Just as one last kind of policy note, um, you know, I work mostly on energy-related issues, not by choice, but by necessity at this point. And this is, you know, one of the problems that I face is that the pipeline itself that they injured all those people for, arrested all those people and poisoned so much for, is, uh, I refer to it as the Dakota Excess Pipeline. And I do that for a couple of reasons. First, if any of you know anything about fracking, what you know is that it's the bottom of the barrel. And so you get in a situation where you have to put in a new well every five years because everything you do, your well runs dry in about five years. This is Bakken well production. And so you have to keep putting in new wells and keep making more messes. And so there is that piece. The other piece is, is that actually in North Dakota, the uh, oil which is going out of North Dakota in 2016 was about 900,000 barrels per day of oil. That all went out basically on truck, tra you know, train or on pipeline. And in 2017, Lynn Helms, the North Dakota Commissioner of Mines and, and uh, such, um, says in 2017, there'll be 900,000 barrels of oil coming out of the Bakken. And in 2019, Lynn Helms also projected that there will be 900,000 barrels of oil coming out of the Bakken. So what I'm trying to figure out is why you have to have a 570,000 barrel a day pipeline. Why they had to do that to us. Why they had to injure so many people. Why could they not just slow down? Why could they just not figure out what they were doing? You know, so to me, the, the vexing problem of, of how greed supersedes basic human rights is something that we're going to have to deal with in America for us all to be well. So this is a little bit of the solution. I like this picture because I kind of think it's like the chances of where we're at at some level, you know, and I'm kind of for the enlightened path, and I really believe that we are all in this together. So let me talk a little bit about you know, the solutions. And I know that this conference this year, you had a number of people who discussed um, local food systems. And I think that that is really part of the antidote to what we are looking at. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experience in local food systems, which is pretty significant. So by training, I'm an economist. And I did some work on the economy of my reservation and, and I figured out that uh, basically we're we spend about eight million bucks a year on food, of which seven million dollars we send off reservation to Food Service of America, Sodexo, uh, Walmart, right? And uh, we really aren't wealthy people. And so the question to me was, you know, how's that going to work out? And then the million that stayed on the reservation, it turns out, was largely spent in um, convenience stores. You're not surprised by this, right? Buying junk food, right? because that's what's in the convenience stores. And this is like a snapshot of rural America. You know, I just have a geographically distinct area that I can study, but this is a snapshot of any county in rural America, largely. You know, the, the demise of the local food system. So over the past 25 years, I've been working to do some restoration of local food systems. And I, I really like this graphic. It's from uh, Steve Primo. He's an artist from the Mille Lacs Reservation, but I think it kind of, shows this spiritual relationship between seeds and people and generations, you know? 
because to us, food is not just um, you know what you buy at the store, what you get. You know, uh, it's it's also this spiritual relationship, and you want your food to be clean, and you want your food to be healthy. And um, so here's our food economy study. You know, as I said, we figured that we spent you know very little of our uh, money on reservation for our food, and so I'm really interested in a community that has one of the poorest counties in the state of Minnesota in it, how you can have a choice between, you know, feeding or heating, basically, you know, basically how you can get better food. And so that is, involves a lot of local food system work, which I really encourage hospitals in every opportunity to partner with local communities to restore. Now, I talked a little bit about, you know, some of our traditional foods to start with. And so what I want to say is it's not just growing food, it's what you grow. Or if you have an ecosystem within which you can harvest, let us pray that you can keep harvesting that. Because those foods, you know, have not only a spiritual value to Anishinaabe people, but they have this deep medical and physical properties that are, that are really, you know, enhance everything else. So this is what, you know, I consider to be part of the answer. Um, this is a hominy corn varieties. I mean, you guys have all had hominy or pasoli, right? Is that... So this is what these are. These are um, northern varieties. And I always have to tell the story that my father, um, when he came to see me when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, you know, he, was a, he went to school to the eighth grade. He was a super smart Anishinaabe man. But he said, um, he came to see me and he said, Winona, I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> That's what he said. And so I, I became a corn grower. So I am a corn grower, and actually this year I'm a hemp grower too. I have one of the uh, permits issued by the state of Minnesota to grow industrial hemp. But I'm going to stick to the corn for eating. I'm not good on the hemp seeds yet, but I'll work on that. Um, get, but you get a lot out of, co out of corn. So it turns out that the tremendous agrobiodiversity of indigenous peoples, I mean, we'll start with 8,000 varieties of corn, not bad, right, that we had figured out a long time ago. A lot of those were lost, but a lot of them are still there. And they have different properties, and you know, you're more scientific on this than I, but you know, the, the, the dark purple guys, they have you know, more of the stuff that blueberries have in it and antioxidants, or you know, they, like, they, there's a color, you know, there's a value in each of those. And you know, when this corn is prepared correctly, um, we, we use um, um, ashes to prepare it. It does something which bioactivates the B vitamins in it. And you do that in pasoli or you do that in hominy. And in that process, it kind of like rocks the nutritional value. And I have no idea how my ancestors figured that out, but that's um, you know, what you want to do. And um, in that process, we have uh, twice the protein and half the calories and much higher uh, B vitamins and um, a, a number of other vitamins in them than uh, traditional like sweet corn varieties. And so it is, you know, I think the work at relocalizing a food system is super important. And it is also not just getting local food, but it's also what you grow. This is some old, old guy growing up by Cass Lake. And then uh, this is a, a kind of a family photo, but my cousins didn't want to take it. So this is me with our Manitoba white flint a few years ago, um, you know, in the restoration of our traditional food economy work. And then um, this one here is me attempting to teach corn braiding to sixth graders uh, in a farm to school program. And a lot of you are probably familiar with the farm to school programs. But you know, my work is not unlike the work of a lot of people who are involved in the health field, which is you know, restoration of traditional knowledge in this case, or restoration of traditional health, and encouraging these young kids, half the kids in that school have obesity, you know, encouraging, and they're just like all mainlining for diabetes, right? Their relatives are all sick. You know, a lot of these kids frankly call me grandma because I'm one of the oldest ladies in my village, right? And I'm 57. That's what we're looking at. You know, we should not be dying at 55, but we're dying at 55 there. And, and, and they're painful deaths. They're painful deaths, whether from cancer or from lupus or from, you know, diabetes. And so, you know, a lot of my interest is in how you get these guys to be proud of their food, how you get these guys to be proud to be farmers, how you get them to, I call it decolonizing your taste buds, you know, to remember what good food was, you know. And, it, I, and my situation is not unlike yours. I mean, there's a generation of people that are younger than me that don't know how to cook. They know how to reheat, you know. 
And that is something that is a health issue in this whole country. If you're going to you know, just be reheating all your food, you're going to lose a lot of nutritional value. And so to me, the, the relationship between good food and uh, good health is very significant. This is some of our squash varieties. And these guys are you know, super high nutrition, traditional varieties, non-GMO heritage varieties. Ericara squash um, is like so you know, very good for you. So the last part of my little talk here is about you know, where we are going. And I guess you know, in the essence of this is like we are all in this together. And the more that we localize our food systems, the less that we use our fossil fuels to ship stuff around, frankly. You know, and I, you know, I have one niece, she lives here in the cities, and one day you know, she's all cool, she's sitting down, she's got like the coconut, chia, almond milk, yogurt, blueberry meal. And it was, I, apparently it was very good for you. You know, but I, I was looking at it thinking, like, what's the damn carbon footprint of that one? <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, we want people to eat cool local foods so you don't have to destroy the planet and ship in them, right? And so that is part of the value of this. And, and you don't need me to tell you the value of working in a garden or harvesting. You know, because that is really the answer to a lot of our, our health issues. And so, you know, my work is in, is, a lot of it is in that. Now this is the village that I live closest to. Now don't get me wrong, I live in a perfect log cabin on a lake, right? And uh, I live there and, and there's usually about nine people at my house at any given moment and I have 10 horses and three dogs and three cats. I mean, we've got a lot going on in my perfect life. But this village is where my grandchildren go to school. All Ojibwe, they are subjected to a lot of agricultural chemicals from potato farming, industrial potato farming that is, surrounds us. Um, you know, high levels of, of, of every kind of disease that would be associated with a lot of the stuff that you spray and overspray, frankly. So this village, this film was done last year, it came out, it was called The Seventh Fire. And the film was a film, um, it kind of was a snapshot of a meth epidemic in our village, which is true. And I'm not the only community that has a meth or an opioid epidemic. The whole country has one from what I can figure out, right? But my community, you know, pretty much, this is a community that nothing trickles down to. No federal funding trickles down to, you know. I'm really grateful to IHS, they, they're there once a week, you know, but it's a very tough situation, you know, in our community. And um, nobody's fixing things there. And so I'm someone that, you know, I, I, it's kind of a question of agency. I really like that term, agency. Like, I believe that we are people who have agency. We have the ability to change things. And we need to exercise that. Because I'm probably like you, I could sit there and, and kvetch or, or angst, you know, about how dismal things are. Or else I could try to make something a little bit different. You know, and so this village is a village that, we saw the film, film called The Seventh Fire, about this really horrific meth epidemic. and. Uh, so I'm going home, and uh, you know, this is where the hemp is going to grow. This is where the corn, those kids are. And this is where the solar thermal panel manufacturing facility is going in. So let me show you what we're doing in our village. Um, instead of the, the houses that were tagged up in the middle of the projects, we started painting them. I, I don't know who's going to do the sociological or psychological study on it, but I have this theory that if you live in a a uh, federal housing project that's 30 years old, that's kind of rough already with some boarded up windows, you don't feel so good about yourself. So we decided to go paint our houses. And so this is one of the seven murals. We'll probably do another 10 this summer um, on our houses. That was actually a tagged up building. And uh, a lot of these people are Wolf Clan, Ling and Dodame, and so they asked for that. Uh, this is solar at my house, actually. Um, you know, I really need about twice as much. Um, and that's some of my family, but, um, and some strays <laughs> I came in. Um, but, um, you know, that's what we have at my house, but we're looking for solar for the elementary school there. Uh, we plan on doing that in that village, putting solar on the elementary school, modeled after a project up in the middle of the tar sands. And then um, we're doing these solar thermal manufacturing. That's nice, huh? Mural on that house. That, that guy came out of California, California native guy. And, uh, this is us solar, putting solar thermal on the houses. And you know, as I said a little bit before, you know, those of you from the Minnesota know this situation, but it's really cold in the wintertime. And in that HUD housing project, there are no trees. So almost all those houses have a south-facing wall. And you can save 25% of your heating bill 
by uh, you know, putting in a uh, solar thermal panel on it. And so in terms of the economic issues associated with trying to pay your heating bills in the North Country, you know, that is one thing that is, it reduces duress on your family if you can cut your heating bill. And the second thing is the larger implications of having a, a sustainable and a renewable energy source as opposed to a fossil fuel energy source. Because my community, I would really like to see us transition. And you know, like I said, like, we're gonna help ourselves. We're gonna help ourselves and we're, you know, we have immense potential to do all of these. And I, you know, and I think about the bigger picture and y'all, you may not do a lot of work on energy, but about two weeks ago, Germany hit this mark of 85% of their power produced on one weekend was from renewables. I was like, go Germany. I was like, how come we can't be Germany? You know what I'm saying? This is like, this is things is that we need to be moving towards and they are really public health issues in every, in every manner of the t way. And this is our water tower. It was all tagged up too when we did it, nice, you know? So I don't know who's gonna get a PhD in doing their study on what that did, you know, but I feel like it makes us feel better to be those people that live in a beautiful place and that have agency to make a difference. You know, so as I think of what it means for us, you know, our Minopamata Ziwan is really very much about this quality of life. And it's not measured with, you know, having more money doesn't change our situation. It's do you have control over your future? Are you healthy? What are your relationships to people? What are your relationships to your government? What are your relationships, you know, to your environment? You know, those are the things, you know, internationally, I think some of you have seen this, there's this whole discussion of instead of having GNP, we have G, um, gross national happiness indexing. And that is, you know, the happiest countries in the world are not, the United States is not the happiest country in the world. We're like way down on the list. And some of the happiest countries in the world are like Vanuatu and Costa Rica, you know. And these are countries that decided to index things differently, to value what was quality of life. Because in that, there is certainly wellness. There's certainly wellness. You know, often I was, I was, I was told by my, my colleague, Paul, that uh, the health care is 20% of the budget now, something like that, you know, that people spend like 20%. So it's like right there with energy and food. And I knew that. My reservation is probably the same. And, you know, I don't want to deprive you of any money, but I would really rather that it is put in wellness, you know. I would like us to be healthy. I don't want to see the number of traumas that I see in my community and the emergency you know, and I think a lot of you would like a little less duress too, you know, if we can have healthy people. And so, you know, people say sometimes what I'm saying is like super out there, but I'm gonna give you a quote that's pretty old school. Maybe you know this quote. Too much and too long, we have surrendered community excellence and community values to the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product, if we should judge the United States of America by that, counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks on our doors and the jails for those who break them. It counts the destruction of our redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder and chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and the cost of a nuclear warhead, armored cars for police who fight riots in our streets, rifles and knives, and television programs which glorify violence in order to sell, sell toys to our children. Yet the GNP does not allow for the health of our children the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. It tells us everything about America except why we are proud to be Americans. Bobby Kennedy, 40 years ago. So I wanna thank you all for your work that you're doing in, in caring for our people. Please remember us and our wild rice, the ecosystem that we seek to preserve, as it is a part of a national discussion on what we will be doing in the future for energy. Remember the courage of our people. I really like this photo, you know? This guy on the right calls me auntie. That's Manga on the right, standing on a horse, you know? That's some courageous people, huh? You know, some courageous people. And we are here, the water protectors are here. And I really feel like everybody at some, le some level should be a water protector, you know, because water gives us life. Without it, we have none. And so I'm really grateful to consider myself one. I'm really grateful to be here to talk with you. This is my sister. You want to give the wave? I always say, if you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to Lorna. <laughs> She's about 6'2". 
So you might want to avoid that unless things go bad. And uh, thank you again for your time, miigwech. Thank you.